Welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. We're at session three. Today we'll talk about morphology and the main question will be what is a word and what parts of words are there? Now that sounds like a very simple question but of course um, it may not be that simple after all. Here's a sentence and I'd simply like you to count the words that you find in this sentence. Bob's linguistics professor is a do-it-yourself kind of guy, isn't he? Okay, count. Okay, I hope you're done. One way to count the sentence would be to say, well, we have Bob's linguistics professor is a do-it-yourself kind of guy, isn't, and he. That's 10 words. But many of you will have different solutions, okay? So some of you might have said linguistics professor, that's really one word, it's a compound. And um, okay, we have this space in between, we have linguistics as a separate word, professor as a separate word, but taken together, uh, they're just one word. <clears throat> and then some of you might have split up uh, do-it-yourself into uh, the three component words that it um, undoubtedly has. And then still others of you may have separated is from the negator not in the contracted form isn't. Right. Okay. So which solution is right? Can we say that one is better than the other? How do we motivate that? Um, in order to approximate these questions, let me talk about several different definitions of what words are. Um, what is a word? Deceptively simple question, really it's not that simple. A first definition that I'd like to cover is the orthographic definition, the definition from writing. And in writing you could say, well, everything's a word that has a space to the left and right. Or maybe a punctuation mark, something like that. Yeah. Um, this gets us pretty far. So, for instance, it would explain this phrase, the combination of letters divided by blank spaces, without any problems, right? So we have uh, eight words in that phrase. But, of course, there are problem cases. Uh, linguistics professor, I mentioned that. That's a compound, arguably. So just one word, despite the space. There is uh, contracted forms like Bob's with the genitive S. Uh, there's a space, but do we want to say that those are separate words? The orthographic definition would say yes, it is. Um, and on the other hand, then we have do it yourself, which clearly uh, comprises several words linked by hyphens, so no space in between. The orthographic definition would say, well, that's one word. Um, you can see how these definitions are somehow arbitrary and don't actually have a lot to do with language per se. Whether you put a hyphen or not, there's often variation and so there's really no principal decision uh, whether something is a word or three words. Also, the orthographic definition is problematic because writing is nothing that's intrinsic to languages. Many languages are not written and um, assuming the orthographic definition would boil down to saying that unwritten languages don't really have words, Okay, that you can't decide whether something in an unwritten language is a word or not. That clearly is undesirable. So we have to move on and find some other definitions of words. Uh, one very useful definition is the so-called prosodic definition, uh, which states that words have one main stress and longer words with many syllables have a main stress and then secondary stresses. So a word like computer has one main stress on the second syllable. Orange has a main stress on the first syllable. University has a stress on the third syllable. And university building has uh, the main stress on the ver and the secondary stress on the first syllable of the second um, compound element, okay? University building. Right, um, so stress seems to get the job done in a good number of cases, but also the prosodic definition is associated with a number of problems. For instance, function words, the little grammatical words, you might call them, um, things like off and in and so on and so forth, they don't carry stress. Okay, When I say uh, the state of California, off doesn't carry stress, so does that mean that off is not a word? 
prosodic definition would suggest just that, and that of course is problematic. Uh, likewise, the prosodic definition suggests that clitics or contracted forms, as in bobs, I'll, he is, don't, and so on and so forth. Like these are, on the prosodic definition, no words in themselves. Um, and that, of course, is also a little arbitrary. Why is uh, is a word in Bob is, and the s in Bob's, um, as in uh, Bob's here right now? Um, why is the s there not a word if Bob is right here right now? Um, is a word. <laughs> so we have to keep looking and consider yet another uh, definition. The third that I'd like to mention is the so-called integrity definition, uh, which states that words are units into which no intervening material can be inserted. So they're kind of like atoms or yeah, uh, atoms where you really can't insert anything um, into the middle of the structure. Um, you can add on to the structure, okay? So you have a atomic little unit like common and you can add on to it and say, well, that's uncommon. Um, create a new word. But crucially, you can't fiddle with the core of a word like common and say that's commonman. Yeah, that's not an English word. Um, this definition, well, you might argue how useful it really is, um, but it certainly captures something about words, and it has only very few exceptions. Uh, the exceptions that it has mostly involve kangaroos. Um, so here's a, an example of kangaroo with an expletive inserted into the middle of the kangaroo. Yeah, um, absolutely, that's another example. But well, when you hear integrity definition of a word, think of a kangaroo with nasty things in between. Right, um, I want to get to another definition, namely the semantic definition. We could say words are those units that describe a unified idea or some semantic concept. Um, so apple, that's a clear idea that you can form in your mind. Lake, um, justice, or even abstract things like minus or electric. Ideas, and we express those ideas with words. Okay, so linguistics professor, a compound, is some kind of coherent idea, and so we might say, well, yeah, that's a word. Now, um, problems with this approach, uh, the semantic definition of words, is that there are lots of distinct concepts that we can identify as humans, as human beings, that are not expressed by words. So, for instance, um, you probably all know the smell of fresh rain in a forest in the fall. It's a very distinctive smell, and if you haven't experienced it, I suggest that you do so uh, in the near future. It's a wonderful smell. Um, however, there's not a single word for it. Uh, the smell of fresh rain in the forest in the fall, that's a whole phrase, not a single word, despite the fact that it describes a distinct concept. Um, also, uh, we find that different languages lexicalize very different um, concepts to different degrees. So Swedish um, distinguishes between aunts that are sisters of the mother and aunts that are sisters of the father. So moster, uh, you see the first half of uh, mother and the second half of sister in the word. That's the aunt who is the mother's sister, and you can probably guess what the aunt who is the father's sister is called in Swedish. Yes, faster is the right answer. Okay. Um, right. Uh, um, sort of the inverse of the smell of fresh rain uh, problem is that humans also give names to things that are concepts that are anything but unified and, uh, and coherent. So globalization is a word that can mean just about anything, lots of different things, and still we find it useful to have a word for this, for all of that. So bottom line is that the semantic definition doesn't get us all that far with regard to words. Sorry, I like semantics, but here it doesn't do the job. 
Coming to the next definition, and this is the one that we'll be working with most in the rest of this course, really. Uh, that's the syntactic definition of words, uh, which rests on the idea that words are the syntactic building blocks of sentences. So when you construct phrases and sentences, you put words together uh, to form larger grammatical units. And um, the basic observation here is that words have a syntactic category. Adjectives, nouns, verbs, auxiliary verbs, and so on and so forth. So, um, something is an adjective if it can occur in certain syntactic slots. For instance, if it can occur in the phrase, have you seen my X thing? Okay, Have you seen my blue thing? Have you seen my expensive thing? Have you seen my squishy thing? Um, well, you can make up examples of your own. Um, likewise, uh, something is a noun if it can occur in the phrase, is this your X? Okay, is this your dog? Is this your umbrella? Is this your husband? And so on and so forth. Okay, um, so in a way these um, words are like those little blocks you see uh, down there in the stacking toy. Um, so they fit into some slots and not in others. Um, so is this your cannot be completed with a verb. Um, is this your walk? No, it doesn't work. Um, now, um, the syntactic definition works rather robustly. Okay, it's good. It's a workable definition of what words are. But nonetheless, I don't want to keep from you that there are problems. There are some words that really are hard to categorize in terms of word classes. For instance, um, if you have a phrase like, well, the more you know. Um, what's the in the more you know? Um, it's kind of like, okay, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Um, it's not a determiner, okay? Um, determiners occur with nouns, so it seems to be something else, but what exactly it is, we don't know. Um, well, elements that occur before um, before adjectives, okay, more an adjective. Um, adverbs occur before adjectives, so we could say the, in this case, is an adverb that looks exactly like the term, but you see how that is a less than satisfying explanation. Um, second example here, what's the by in by and large? By, uh, in its normal life, so to speak, is a preposition. You can have a house by the lake. I uh, promise to hand in the paper by the deadline. So there by is followed by a nominal group. But in by and large, we have a phrase that is um, seemingly composed of a preposition, a conjunction, and an adjective. And that, to all intents and purposes, is crazy. Shouldn't exist in any language, but it does, and people use it and feel good about themselves, so we have to deal with it. All right, syntactic definition of the word. Um, here's a brief reminder of the definitions um, that we have of words. So the syntactic definition here, uh, the semantic definition that didn't turn out to be as useful, orthographic definition, ah, can't use it, prosodic definition, useful, but problematic with regard to contractions and so on and so forth, and um, this chain, the integrity definition about kanga fucking ruse. Right, moving on. Um, words we can usefully define as the building blocks of phrases and sentences. Uh, there are members in a syntactic category, barring for a moment things like by and by and large. And there are linguistic units that have usually a main stress, sometimes a secondary stress, and they're usually indivisible if we discard kanga fucking roots. Okay, moving on. Um, there are several kinds of words. There are simplex words and complex words. Um, simplex words consist of a single part like orange, ball, uh, lake, or crocodile. 
so they just have a single recognizable part. And in other words, uh, you can recognize several parts. Okay, so <clears throat> think of unhappy, distasteful, or uh, one recent or not so recent coinage, misunderestimate. Um, well, it doesn't make sense, but it still is a word. Yeah. So in these words, you can distinguish parts. In happy, you have happy and unhappy. In distasteful, you have taste, full, so you can tasteful, and then distasteful to mean the opposite. And um, in misunderestimate, you have estimate, underestimate, misunderestimate. So there are these parts. Um, and these parts of complex words, we'll define them in a minute, they're called morphemes. Um, sounds a bit like a chemical element. Watch out, morpheme. Inflection may occur. Um, yeah, what are morphemes? Um, the morpheme can be defined as the smallest linguistic unit that carries meaning. Okay, it carries meaning, and uh, this allows us to ask questions like, okay, how many morphemes are there in untruthfulness? Um, okay, we have truth. That's one morpheme. Um, truthful, full. It's another uh, morpheme, un, another morpheme, and then ness, uh, another morpheme. Okay, in the rest of the session, I want to explain how there are different types of morphemes in the English language. Um, a first useful distinction to make is that there are free morphemes and bound morphemes. So some morphemes, they occur independently as one morphemic words, things like orange, drink, purple, or truth. And there are other morphemes that are bound, um, which means they only ever occur as parts of larger words. Uh, think of things like li or un or uh, er, er uh, or meant. You don't find them walking around all on their own, right? Um, they always attach to some other word. They're bound to that word. Um, so in slowly we have one part that's called the base. Okay, that's an independent word, slow, and an affix, uh, a dependent, a bound morpheme. And together they form slowly. Uh, uncool, there, un is the affix, cool is the base, and player, play is the base, er is the affix, and in judgment, um, judge is the base, and uh, meant is the affix. Right. Um, there are different types of affixes uh, that you can classify depending on their position relative to the base. So prefixes occur before the base, suffixes, they follow the base, and then there's a small little class of infixes, um, which you might say, all right, don't these, are, are, aren't these the Kangafuck and Rue uh, morphemes? Well, not quite. Um, they refer to things like speedometer, okay, uh, which is technically a compound with a little infix in there. Yeah. Mm. Doesn't occur all that often. It will be on the exam, though. So, make a note of it. <clears throat> right. Um, bound morphemes. They're really the interesting stuff of morphology, bound morphemes. Um, there are several types of them. Let's look at uh, different bound morphemes. A big class of bound morphemes go by the name of derivational morphemes. Uh, derivational morphemes are bound morphemes that are used to create new words. Um, so you can use a derivational suffix like li to create adverbs from adjectives, as in slowly, um, quickly, gently, expensively, nicely, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can use the prefix un to create new adjectives from already existing adjectives. So uncool, um, untruthful, <laughs> um, unappealing. Is that a word? I don't think so. Okay, um, so if these affixes are attached to a specific base, the resulting combination, slowly, uncool, player, judgment, yields a word that has a new meaning. So slowly 
has a slightly different meaning than the meaning of slow. And uncool has the opposite meaning of the adjective cool. Okay, so derivational morphemes change meaning. And often, the uh, derivational morphemes also create new word classes, so that the derived word belongs in a different word class than the base. Uh, in the case of slowly, the, the base is an adjective, and slowly is an adverb. In the case of player, play is a verb, uh, player is a noun, not a verb, as it says in the slides. Sorry. Okay. But then, of course, um, derivational morphemes don't always change the word class. In uncool, for instance, you see that uh, cool is an adjective, uncool also is an adjective. Okay. Um, right. Um, <clears throat> One thing that we'll do in class is um, analyze different affixes like full, able, and ness, and we'll check out um, what specifications, what constraints there are on the basis that these affixes occur with. So look out for that. Right. Um, what definitional criteria are there for derivational morphemes? Well, uh, they create new words with different meaning. That's a core criterion, and they can change the word class of the base. That's another important thing to remember. However, remember that not all derivational morphemes change word class. Uh, this concerns primarily the prefixes. Um, so un gets uncool from cool, dis gets disprefer from prefer, under gets underrepresent from represent, and so on and so forth. So prefixes don't change the word class. Okay, um, now, problems with derivational morphemes, yeah, mm. I got 99 problems, and derivational morphemes are some of them. Um, derivational morphemes can become opaque, so that speakers do no longer see a historical morpheme boundary anymore. Um, you can see this in uh, words like language, or envelope, or balance, or neighbor. These look like monomorphemic, simplex words to present-day English speakers. However, historically, they actually um, were bimorphemic. So, language is uh, formed of Norman French long and the derivational suffix age. So, it's the, the tonguing, if you like. Yeah? Um, envelope, you, know, you put something into an envelope. You, you, in you input something yeah uh, balance there's the prefix by okay that's two things and and um, the lens part uh, refers to a scale and uh, neighbor is also bimorphemic nay you see the, the nigh maybe that you know from archaic uh, uses of English Nigh and boar, that's the one who, who lives somewhere, um, peasant, okay? So the peasants who are close, those are your neighbors back in the day. These days, neighbors occur everywhere. All right, um, we come to a second important class of morphemes, and those are inflectional morphemes. Inflectional morphemes uh, we can define as bound morphemes used to mark grammatical distinctions, uh, as in cats, collected, sleeps and louder. Um, important difference between derivational and inflectional. Inflectional morphemes change the form of a word, but not the word class, and neither do they change the central meaning of the word. Okay. Um, the main function of inflectional morphemes is to mark grammatical distinctions. So uh, cat versus cats, what's marked by the inflectional morpheme there is the grammatical distinction of singular versus plural. Are we talking about one thing or are we talking about many things? Uh, in collects versus collected, uh, we mark the distinction present versus past. So does something happen right now or did something happen uh, way back when? Loud and louder, uh, those are adjective forms that contrast the positive, the simple form, if you like, of an adjective and the comparative um, Form louder. Okay, 
So that's what inflectional morphemes do. Um, conveniently, there are only eight inflectional morphemes, give or take. You could, you know, could arrive at nine or so uh, with a bit of generous counting. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it'll be enough if you remember eight of them. Uh, here's a table. If you're like me, you have trouble memorizing stuff that occurs in a table. So I made you a little um, mnemonic. Okay. There are eight inflectional morphemes in English, and you can remember all of them if you remember this little haiku that I wrote. Um, yes, I did. I'm a poet. Um, a group of cats eats John's sandwich that he topped with cheese, produced by grazing cows happier than the happiest clam. Okay. All eight inflectional morphemes are in there. Cats, that's the plural morpheme, eats, the present tense, the third person singular. John's, the genitive S, topped, um, the past tense ED, produced, that's the participial ED, grazing, the ING form, happier, the comparative, and happiest, the superlative. Perfect haiku, it ends with the superlative. Can't get any better than that. Okay, summing up differences between derivational and inflectional. Uh, derivational morphemes can change the word class, they can create new meanings, they can over time become semantically opaque. Think of balance, yeah? By, lens. Nobody knows it anymore. Um, inflectional morphemes, on the other hand, they encode grammatical meanings. Uh, they are never prefixes, by the way. Inflectional morphemes always at the end. Uh, inflection tends to be fully productive. Okay, productivity, I haven't really talked about that. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, derivation is often restricted so that um, inflectional suffixes, like uh, the present tense s, every verb can take that, but not every adjective can the affix iti, as in uh, brevity, gravity, and so on and so forth. Um, right, and then lastly, inflectional morphemes always occur to the right of derivational morphemes, so always on the outside edges of the word. Last point, um, and a fun point, are cranberry morphemes. Cranberry morphemes are bound morphemes that are not affixes. There are things like cran, huckle, and lingen in these words, cranberry, huckleberry, lingonberry, or sieve in um, receive, perceive, conceive, um, or mit in uh, permit, submit, commit. Um, yeah. Strange. Strange. <clears throat> Here's a little overview of the types of morphemes that I'd like you to remember. Um, the biggest split is between free and bound morphemes. Free morphemes um, can be distinguished into lexical content words like green or idea or juice and function words in and of, uh, must, you, and so on and so forth. And um, the bound morphemes, they can be distinguished into inflectional affixes, uh, I don't know, group of cats, eats, and so on and so forth. And then derivational affixes um, like meant, upple, itty, and so on and so forth. And then these little cranberry morphs. I'll give you some bonus points on the exam. Okay, questions we'll talk about in class. I'll see you next time.